So there's a, the message for this morning is from Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. It's printed in the bulletin if you want to follow along on the reading. You really don't have to. You can listen. <laughs> Jesus said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he was cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say that this mulberry tree be uprooted and planted into the sea, and it would obey you. Listen. Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to that servant when he's coming from the field, Come in and sit down and eat something? Won't he rather say to him, Prepare supper for me and dress yourself and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? And does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? So also, when you have done all that you were commanded, simply say we're unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. So that, that's what we're looking at today. It is excellent. We've got we've got these seemingly unconnected things, and I say seemingly because I think they all go together. In fact, I think three chapters of Luke go together that we have been talking about because Jesus has been. Uh, you, if, if you think back a few weeks, if you were here, we did uh, we did one parable, which was the prodigal son, and and it turns out that a big part of that parable was the uh, the prodigal son had gone away and wasted all his father's stuff and then come home. That's the younger son, and then the older son refused to come into the party. That was one of the parables, and then the older son is like the Pharisees who who were. Um, Instead of recognizing the righteousness and holiness of Jesus that was in front of them, they were mad because he was eating with sinners and things like that. And then we have another parable that Jesus told, which was the great banquet. And there was a man who had a banquet, and he had told people ahead of time that he was going to have a banquet. And then when it was time for the banquet, he sent his servants out to say, come to the banquet. And they all made excuses and said they didn't want to come. And so he gathered in everybody from the street that he could find and in that instance, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are the, the, the people who wouldn't come to the banquet when it was time to come to the banquet. The Messiah, Jesus, who had been predicted throughout the Old Testament, had arrived, and for whatever reason, they would not come to him. And so now, and, and so now we get to this, and, and Jesus has been telling these parables, and then he says, listen, now he's speaking back to his disciples, which uh, disciples is going to be kind of everybody around who's listening and wants to learn. And he says, temptations to sin are sure to come. It's impossible to conceive of stumbling blocks not coming in people's lives. But woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea. So who is it? Is that something we need to be afraid of? Well, I think everything is worth watching for. But I think still he's talking to the Pharisees. Because remember, they're part of the crowd. They're listening. And he says, woe to the ones through whom the stumbling block comes. Now, another time, Jesus was, um, he was talking to the Pharisees. And in, in his subtle, sort of non-confrontational way, he said... Woe to you Pharisees who travel over land and sea to make a disciple, and when you do, you make him twice the son of hell as you are. Very subtle. Very subtle, that Jesus guy. Meek. And, and so here he said it's it's the same thing. He's saying to the people who are, are creating roadblocks for those who want to enter into the grace of God. Creating roadblocks for those who want to find redemption in their life. Presenting roadblocks for people who want to enter into God's joy. The, the, the religious leaders would had all these things, hoops people were supposed to jump through. And Jesus is just welcoming them, right? And so, woe to the people who put all these roadblocks. And then he says, and now he's actually talking to us, pay attention to yourselves. Now, 
That's a great little phrase. Because it does, who, who does it say not to pay attention to? Yeah, isn't that great? Pay attention to yourself. <laughs> I like that. Because that tells me who I'm supposed to be looking at, right? If you, you remember, there was, maybe you remember, Jesus, uh, there was another parable where uh, Jesus, a uh, man, sowed a field, and, uh, and when the grain started coming up, there were weeds with it. And um, the servants in the parable said, do you want us to go pick the weeds? And the master said, don't go pick the weeds. Because when you pick the weeds, you'll pull up the weed too. And then Jesus said, it's like that. Don't, don't, it's not your job to go figure out who's weed and who's weed. Pay attention to yourself. You are the one for whom you are responsible. Pay attention to yourselves. And then he gives us this thing. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And now rebuke, when we think of rebuke, we think of something rather harsh. And, and that's not really what's going on here. He, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault. That's in Matthew 18. What he's saying is don't just let it go. You, you can't bear this stuff. Your relationships have to be tended. They have to be, they have to be healthy. The, the kingdom of God is a place where people don't shove their feelings inside and, and don't just sort of uh, um, disregard what's going on. They want real relationships. They want holy relationships, relationships that are peace-filled. So if your brother sins against you, I'm going to change that to go and tell him his fault, because that's in Matthew 18. And if he repents, forgive him. That's fine. I think everybody could say, you know what, if someone, that's good relational advice, right? If somebody does something, uh, if they turn a relationship with that kind of uh, hurts your feelings or whatever, you need to go talk to them. I think everybody would say that. But then Jesus goes on, and he says, and if he sins against you seven times in one day, and turns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you must forgive him. And let's not just blow by that, okay? I want you to put yourself in a situation. Somebody does something, you know, somebody you're in a close relationship with, a friend, a spouse, a child, a parent, hurts your feelings in some way in the morning. And then, and then, and then you know, a couple of days later, they go, you know, yeah, I was really crabby, I'm sorry I did that. Sorry I said that. And then about, it's Saturday, so everybody's home. And about 10 o'clock, they do the same thing. That's two. And then about noon, over lunch, they do the same thing again. And they say, oh, I'm sorry, that's three. And then sometime in the middle of the afternoon, no, they do exactly the same thing. And, they, and then a couple of days go, wow, I'm really sorry. That's four. How many of you are starting to get tired of hearing this? <laughs> and we're only at four, right? And then afternoon, evening, after dinner. What's the point Jesus is making? He's not giving us a count. He's saying that in the kingdom of God, in the place where God is running the show, there is forgiveness. And it is forgiveness without measure. And that's what's been shown to us. And that's why Jesus calls on, tells us that that's what we are to offer people. And I think if we step back and we just go through a day where this happens seven times in a row, now we can understand the disciples' response. Increase our faith. How are we possibly going to do that? That isn't that. That's like over the top. And Jesus says, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And here, what, what, uh, we had recently the parable of the unjust steward who was commended by his manager for going for, by the owner of the land for altering the accounts, and we struggled with what in the world that meant. And now we have to struggle again. What does it mean to have faith like a mustard seed? If you go read six books, you're going to get eight different answers. Because, because there's, no, there's, no like, there's no index in the back of the book that says mustard always symbolizes this. But the thing is, the thing that's true that, that you can't get away from is the size. A mustard seed is very small. It may not be the very smallest seed, but it's tiny. And so Jesus is, is definitely, regardless of what he's getting at with the mustard seed, he's definitely saying it's, it's um, if you had as much faith, that, here's what I think is going on. I think a mustard seed is all faith. A mustard seed does what the mustard seed does. The mustard seed doesn't do six different things. A mustard seed gets planted, it germinates, it takes in sunlight and water and nutrients from the soil and grows. So a, a mustard seed feeds on the things it's supposed to feed on and it is all faith. 
It just lives. The mustard seed uh, is an example of faith because it's tiny and it just feeds on what it's supposed to feed on and then it grows into a big bush. But another place, Jesus uh, used the mustard seed to talk about the kingdom of God like that. And he said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that starts out very tiny, but you plant it, and it grows into a big bush that the birth will come and rest in. And so, so here he's telling us that, that forgiveness, it's a tiny thing, day by day, one by one, right? You, usually the things we have to forgive are tiny things one by one. But as we forgive over and over and over again, they're going to grow. And that's where the kingdom of God grows. That's where God rules. God rules where there's grace and forgiveness, not where everybody sits up straight and follows whatever booklet, you know, the particular denomination has put out. God rules where there's grace. And then he gives us this parable, uh, um, this last one. And he says, now, he says, now, basically what he's saying, listen, you're, this is how you're going to be. And when you do this, it's just what you ought to do. This is just, you, you're not, this is not like, this is not the great effort for which you're going to get a cake when you come into heaven. This is just the way it is. This is the way people who follow God and want to be part of his kingdom act. He says, listen, will any of you who has a servant, if, if you have a servant and they, they're out in the field and then they come in, you say, oh, come on in, that was a rough day. Why don't you sit down? I'll get you something to eat. No, that's, that's not the way a person with servants acts, I guess. I've never had a servant, so I don't know. Um, my kids think they are, but I think they are. No, that's not what happens. It, you, your servant comes in, and then he fixes you dinner, and then he gets to eat after that. And when he's done, your servant, who, had, who spent the day doing what he's supposed to do, does not expect a party or streamers or anything else. It's just the way it is. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. And I, th I think this whole thing flows very, very nicely. Because I think it starts out with the, the Pharisees who put all these barriers up for people that, to, to, that they think are barriers to people entering the kingdom of God. You know what the council in Jerusalem said to the early Christian converts who were not Jews? Uh, they, there were people who were not Jews coming into the Christian church, and they wrote to the council in Jerusalem and said, what should we do? What kind of things do we need to do? Give us a list. And the church in, the, the church in Jerusalem was like, ah, I don't know. We're not really into lists. I mean, the whole point is not the list. The point is the love. Let's see. Um, you should probably, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. And, and, and stay away from like blood stuff and strangle animals and, and avoid sexual immorality. That seems like a good list. You do that, you'll be fine. Now that's a little smaller list than the than all the the, uh, the commands and, and, and instructions that the Pharisees had about how many steps you could walk on the Sabbath without violating the law and all that stuff. And, and so that's that's where we go with this is. It, we watch out for the spirit of the Pharisees because it can sneak up on us. This legalism, this idea of the things people need to do can sneak up on any of us. And the longer we're in the church, it, the more that can happen. And it can definitely happen with things like rituals and, and forms of worship and ways we pray and all that stuff. And, and that's all... The, our rituals and our forms of worship are there like, um, like a trellis. They're there to support our faith but they're not there to command our faith. Uh, um, the service has a certain structure that's been a structure for 1,500 years, and, and, but it's that because it works, not because it's a command of God to do worship that way. There is no command of God to do worship any way except in spirit and in truth. All this other stuff, our traditions that have developed that have people, uh, Christians, have found useful over the years, and that, that's why we do them. So we got to watch out for the Pharisees. And then the second thing is, so so if you don't want to be like a Pharisee, instead of standing up as a commander, if there's a rift, you repair it. If it's a rift seven times in one day, you go repair it. You seek to reconcile those relationships. You don't just walk away from things. And when someone will reconcile, you be reconciled to them. This is, in fact, uh, let's see. Where it's, it says, if you sin seven times in a day, it turns to you seven times and say, I, I repent. If the translator here says, you must forgive him. But it, what it really says is, you will forgive him. 
will forgive him. It's almost, it's, it's kind of a command, but it's almost just a description of someone who's walking with God. It's actually the same thing, by the way, going on with the Ten Commandments. If you, if you get into the grammar of the Ten Commandments, it doesn't actually say, thou shalt, it's like a command. It says, you will. You will not steal. You will not commit adultery. You will not bear false witness. So there's sort of a command aspect to it, but there's also this aspect to it of when you are uh, living a life that is seeking God, this is, this, is a dis- this is simply a description of the way you will live. And, and, and so we get through this, and, and we see Jesus once again with the same thing he's always done. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. What is the kingdom of God? It's where God's way rules. And what is God's way? It is repent. It is love and redemption and peace and reconciliation and, and, and not standing up with your rules but rejoicing when people are reconciled and being willing to take the risks. That's why it takes faith. And this is this is kind of the point here, I think, is, is that, listen... The first time somebody repents, let's at breakfast they do that thing that hurts your feelings or whatever, or, or was wrong or whatever, they, they repent and you say, I forgive you. That's fine. You move on. That seems normal. The second one, the third, I think most of us would say, by three times in one day, we would say, you know what? Why don't we hold off on that reconciliation? <laughs> let's just see if this is going to stick, right? And, and that's not what Jesus says. And the reason is, and the reason the disciples say increase our faith is because by that point, you have lost faith in the other person. You can't tell me it's not true. If someone does something three or four times in one day and keeps coming back and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're like, how sorry are you? Really? How sorry are you? I have no faith in you that you're not going to do that again. So what faith do you need? You need faith in God. That's where you get the faith to forgive other people. It doesn't come from them because they are not worthy of it because sometimes they, they are going to hurt you again. Your faith to forgive other people, your faith to reconcile with other people, your faith to go to them and say, you know, uh, this stands between us, that's, that's not going to come from your faith in the other person. That comes from faith in God. Because God says this is the way to live and it will work out. This is the way to live. And sometimes, and I'll tell you, it's, it would seem it, it would seem either uh, Pollyanna-ish or just plain stupid to forgive somebody that seventh time in a worldly sense. But God says this is the way in forgiveness and love, and that takes faith in God. That's the life that God calls people to. That's the that's where the kingdom moves where there's enough faith in God to forgive other people who don't really seem to merit forgiveness at the moment. That's how we walk in the love and the peace that God has for us. The verse at the bottom here is one of my favorite verses, Galatians 5, verse 6. It says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. And that's covered for the whole law. But faith, working itself out through love, and that's the way it looks in the kingdom. Faith, faith enough to continue, continue, continue to reconcile the relationships in the world. Let's take a moment and pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you uh, for the chance to be here this morning, for the chance to hear from your word. Uh, Father, I am so, let me just say, I'm so grateful you're not a Pharisee. Um, because I, I read about the Pharisees and all their laws and having to count steps and, 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 and weigh out my spices to tithe. And, and Lord, that if that was the path you have given us to peace, I would be left in terror because I've never made it. And so I'm just so grateful that you have given us your way and shown us that your way is not that way. That your way is love and forgiveness. Father, you have been so, you've been loving to us and sending Jesus to be our Savior. Loving beyond measure. Help us to take your love into our hearts so that as we live, in our own little ways, when we are uh, separated from others, we can be 
forgiving in our little areas of life as you have been forgiven to the entire world. In Jesus' name. And we're going to close with a little prayer we're going to pray together. This is the prayer for the week that's in your book. Let's pray this together. Father, give me faith in you, strong enough to forgive others. In Jesus' name.